I'm going to explain exactly how we can fix the experience problem in Pokemon Sword and Shield for future entries, starting right now. So one of the things that was really controversial when Pokemon Sword and Shield was about to come out was that they revealed that the experience share in that game would always be on. In essence, that meant that every Pokemon in your party would gain experience in battle, with those that participated in battle gaining the full amount, and those that didn't gaining half. This has been an issue in the series more or less since X and Y. X and Y decided to introduce this change to the experience share and what that led to in that game in particular, and also in Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire since those games run off the same engine, is that the amount of experience you get is way, way, way too much for the level of the Pokemon you face. And so you end up where your levels are significantly higher than your opponent's levels. I think when I beat Pokemon Y for the first time, my team was in the 70s, whereas the Champions team was in the 60s. It was pretty bad. So part of the reason as to why that happened, in addition to introducing the new experience share, was that they reverted one of the changes made in Generation 5. In Generation 5, you gained experience relative to the level of the Pokemon you defeated. So if your level was higher than a Pokemon that you knocked out, you gained less experience. If your level was lower, you gained more. Generation 6 just got rid of this, and it led to the fact that your Pokemon will just get continually higher and higher level, regardless of to what's happening. Generation 7 went back and undid this, and it worked out more or less in Generation 7's favor. I felt the level scaling in Generation 7 was a lot, a lot better than what we saw in Generation 6. I am going to say, though, that in Let's Go, which is technically part of Generation 7, they kind of went back to where it was by first being the first game to put the experience share always on, but also just giving you way too many multipliers on captures. So moving into Generation 8, the level scaling is more or less the same, although depending on how you play, you will probably wind up a few levels over what your opponents are going to be, and will likely wind up steamrolling the rest of the game so long as you have the right type advantages. And trust me, not having those type advantages can make your game actually hard. That is how I lost to, I think her name's Bea in <laughs> Sword, because I didn't have anything to adequately counter fighting types, so I kind of had to spam items to just wait out her Dynamax Machamp, and yeah, no, it was not a pleasant time. So enough with all that. We're going to move into the meat of this video, which is going through and explaining exactly what will make this system a lot more balanced. And fair warning, there is going to be a fair degree of math here, so if you're not a huge fan of that, this video may not be for you. But before you click off, I'm going to try to make this as accessible as possible for those of you who are not as strong in math, and I will do my best to basically make sure that you understand what's going on even if you don't have the background to understand this. But without further ado, let's cut to voiceover and I'm going to show you a fair degree of how this system actually works. So experience in the Pokemon games is calculated using a very specific set of values. The main values that we're concerned about are the base experience yield for each Pokemon species, the level of the defeated Pokemon, your level, as well as a few other factors that I'll get to. They are plugged into the formula that you see on screen and I promise it's not as scary as it looks. Of these variables, half of these are bonus multipliers for something or other. All of the ones that are currently highlighted in red are ones that are multipliers for something, be it the lucky egg or anything else. Because of that, we can safely treat these numbers as one and move on and not really worry about them because for the duration of your playthrough, you're probably not going to be dealing with these. So the values that we have left that we concern ourselves with are A, which is whether or not a Pokemon is owned by a trainer or not, which from Generation 7 onwards is not the case, that number is always one in those games. B, the base experience yield of the Pokemon. L, the level of the fainted or caught Pokemon. LP, the level of the Pokemon receiving experience. And lastly, we had S, which was used in previous games to split the experience evenly amongst the party. In current games, it literally is used just to determine whether or not you were in battle or not. If you're in battle, that number is 1. If you're not in battle, that number is 2, which will effectively half the amount of experience you get. So the first thing that I suspected that might have been part of this issue was that a change in the base experience yields of the various Pokémon. So what I did was I took each generation, and I took the experience yield of every available Pokémon in those games, including form changes. So what I found was that the average level, the mean, seemed to stay pretty consistent. It didn't change too terribly much. It was at its lowest in Generation 2, and it was at its highest in Generation 7. Same thing goes for the median. The median 
doesn't change that much at its lowest in Generations 1 and 2, at its highest in Generation 7. The mode is where it gets interesting, so for those of you who don't remember, mode is the most common element, which in most statistical analyses is not super useful, but I just was looking at it out of curiosity, and what I found was that in Generations 1, 2, 3, and 8, it was fairly low, and in Generations 4 through 7, it was a lot higher. So there's a number of reasons for this. What I kind of came down to was that Generation 4 started introducing a lot more legendaries, and there's just a lot more highly evolved Pokemon that just have these higher base experience yields, but generally you don't wind up encountering them. So overall, while there, it's not a super pressing issue. And obviously it goes back down in Generation 8 because a lot of those Pokemon were cut from the Pokedex. Moving into the standard deviation, this is where it gets really interesting. So standard deviation, for those of you who don't know, is a rough measure of variance in a data. So a higher standard deviation means that when you look at data, it varies a lot further from the mean if you were to randomly pick a number from the set. So for generations one through four, that number's sitting in the low 50s. It's pretty consistent. For generations five through eight, it jumps up to the high 70s, with in generation eight, it getting up to 81. So by looking at this, what we can parse from this data is that average experience for every Pokemon is still roughly the same across all the generations, but the amount it varies and the way the data is spread out is a lot higher. So moving into the frequency in which we see a lot of different data, this is where a very, very interesting trend starts to emerge. So what I found was that overall, most of the experience is concentrated between 51 and 200. That is the majority of Pokemon. And what we find is that as the generations go on, most of the new Pokemon that are being added either have between 51 and 100 or 151 and 200. That middle section, 101 to 150, is getting smaller or more or less it's staying consistent, but is getting smaller relative to the overall number of Pokemon. And what this will do is since the mean and median are both in that range, it will start to spread the data out a little bit more. So looking at this overall, what we're gonna find is that it isn't going to have that big of an impact. So my initial hypothesis was that Game Freak had changed the experience yield for a bunch of Pokemon and had upped it significantly, but that really isn't the case. There's just a few Pokemon that they did this to, like Blissey. So if it's not the base experience yield of Pokemon, then maybe there's something else in the formula that we could change or alter how this formula works in order to make this stuff more balanced. So we're going to start with something that isn't actually a variable. We're gonna start with this number right here, this 2.5 we see here in the formula. So as you can see, this section of the formula has on the top twice the knocked out Pokemon's level plus 10 raised to the 2.5 power over the level of the knocked out Pokemon plus the level of your Pokemon, plus 10, raised to the 2.5 power. So if both your Pokemon are the same level, the top and bottom of this fraction will resolve to the same number, which will then cancel out and become one. Meaning that this is the base amount of experience your Pokemon would get if there is no level difference. What we find is that as your level gets higher, the bottom will start to get bigger and cause this number to go down. And we'll also find that as your level decreases, the bottom gets smaller, causing the whole number to get higher. And the degree to which this changes varies based on the exponent. So what I found was that by changing this exponent to a number, say, 2, 3, up to 4, we found that the higher the number gets, the more experience you get from knocking out a higher level Pokémon, and the less experience you get from knocking out a lower level Pokemon. Overall, based on this graph though, you can see that it, while significant, isn't going to be super amazing if your levels are gonna be keeping pace or slightly below enemies, at which point, by changing this exponent to be higher, you're just gonna make the problem potentially worse. You're not gonna actually be fixing it per se. So this brings me to the thing that I think actually worked. So I mentioned earlier that from generation 5 onwards, the value of A, the value that determines whether or not the Pokémon is owned by a trainer or not, was always 1. The amount of experience gained from a Pokémon 
doesn't matter whether or not it's in the wild or used by a trainer. So my thought was, if this number is not actively in use, and it was initially used to increase the amount of experience you get from a trainer Pokemon, what if we just took this number and just changed it constantly for every Pokemon? What this will do in essence is it will cause the amount of experience you get to decrease. Just flat out. So my thought was, okay, let's just change A and see what that ends up doing. So the numbers I tested were 1, 0 0.8, 0 0.625, 0 0.5, and 0.4. And so by plugging these numbers in, we see that basically the whole curve of experience you get from your level based on an example Pokemon is shifted down. So if we were to say, okay, you're getting a couple levels over the opponents and you wanna be either about where they are or potentially lower, we just change this number. And what's interesting about this and kind of where I think that Sirius should go theoretically is basically have this number be mapped to a difficulty setting. So you could say have opponent's Pokemon become higher level in a challenge mode, but you could just as easily keep them more or less the same, but just decrease the amount of experience you'll get. So basically to have the same experience as someone who's playing on a lower difficulty, you would have to basically grind. And so this is probably the way to go. Keep the experience share on, but just decrease the amount of experience every Pokemon gets across the board. And what this will do is it will cause you to have a somewhat harder time because you won't be able to gain experiences readily. It makes it so that if you want to challenge, you're not discouraged to capture Pokemon. In some cases, if we were to lower this number enough, you would have to. You would be required to catch Pokemon because there is no other way to gain enough experience to meaningfully challenge gym leaders without grinding if you were to drop the number too much. Obviously, this isn't the only issue with Pokemon difficulty. I think overall, the series has always been on the easier side. It's not been a everything before X and Y were super hard and everything after was super easy. No, they were, they've been pretty easy the whole time. It's not been a huge issue. So there's a couple other things that the series needs to do, and that includes, but it's not limited to, better move sets on AI, smarter AI in general, and maybe moving away from gym leaders that are type specialists because those are way too easy to sweep, so maybe base them around a specific strategy or do something else just to make them more interesting because a lot of the gym leaders that were tough were only tough because they had something that was kind of broken for that point in the game. Psychic type just overall was broken in Generation 1, and the remakes, the lack of dark types makes it still challenging. Generations 2 and 3, normal type only has one weakness, and both Miltank and Slacking are kind of beasts to deal with at that point in the game. Same goes for Generation 4, especially in Platinum, Fantina is kind of unfair, having Miss Magius as the third gym leader. And this can be seen when you look at the hardest champions. The hardest champions are usually champions that use every type. I think all of us are scarred by Cynthia, and if you look at her team, it's really, really diverse in terms of the types that it represents. It also doesn't help that Generation 4 is one of the worst generations for just having a really egregious level spike when you get into the Elite Four, which is something that since Generation 5 we haven't seen as much of, since you don't fight the Elite Four in a set order anymore, but it's still significant. So to kind of wrap this video up, I'd say that our solution, based on the data I saw, is to go with just maybe changing that A value to 0.8 or 0.625 and just overall decrease the amount of experience or keep the experience formula as is, but just change the multiplier based on, say, a difficulty setting. Now, whether or not Game Freak wants to do that is a completely different story. They seem to want to just cater to kids as much as possible and have no reason to want to change this, so yeah, that's where we're currently at. But hopefully what I've demonstrated is that the experience share itself is not what's broken, but rather everything else that supports the experience share just needs to be tweaked, and then an always-on experience share can 100% work and be balanced. Anyways, if you enjoyed this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe for more content like this in the future. Also, when you subscribe, make sure you click on that bell icon so that you're notified every time I upload a new video. But lastly, I want you to leave me a comment telling me what you think Pokemon could do to maybe fix their issue with experience. Should they remove capture experience? Should they reduce the number of trainers? Or should we just do what I did and just literally change the formula? I'd love to hear what you guys think. But until that time, guys, peace.